ain't she sweet? See her walking down the street. Now I ask you very confidentially, ain't she sweet? Now cast an eye in her direction. Oh me, oh my, ain't that perfection? Doodle 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 doodle. Yeah, I mean, look at you. Blonde hair, tiny waist, larger than life bosoms, yet perfectly wholesome Doris Day feel about you. What are you doing? Single, a decade past the median age of 20.3 that a woman in 1960 should be married. Taking birth control pills, having sexy lunch hours in a hotel with Sam, who says that he wants to marry you but just can't because of the alimony payments. You do believe him because of his eyes and the way he touches you, but today you put your foot down, enough already, something's got to give. You slip your dress back over your snow white lingerie and return to the office as innocence incarnate. I enjoy being a girl, where you get to endure a pompous big client who sits on the edge of your desk and asks in your face if you know what he does about unhappiness. He buys it off, he says, then asks, are you unhappy? You give him your best cupy doll stare, and he continues, I'm buying this house for my niece's wedding present, $40,000 cash. God, that is huge. That kind of money could set you and Sam free, he says, and that's not buying happiness. It's just buying off unhappiness. Oh, he's cagey, he's cool, he implies cash is smart and safe. And you smile weakly and suddenly the devil's handing you $40,000 and you're putting it in your handbag. Your boss, Mr. Lowry, said to, and of course, because you're the girl that everybody trusts. And when you say that you have a headache, you truly do. Your head is splitting. Devil or angel, you can't make up your mind. Your boss says, go put the money in the bank, sweetheart, and then go home and sleep that headache off. Strangely, instead of the bank, you take the money and your headache home you bad devil girl, and change your white lingerie to black, put the money in your black purse, ignoring the picture of your parents looming on the dresser. <laughs> You're done being angelic and working as a secretary, one of four jobs women get to have in 1960. When's an opportunity to buy off unhappiness with untraceable money ever coming your way again? Gonna drive to Sam in Fairvale. Won't have another unhappy day in your life. Keep your mind on your driving, keep your hands on the wheel, keep your snoopy eyes on the road ahead. Oh look, there's your boss walking in front of your car. Oh, hi, Mr. Lowry, oh my God. Now you're both wondering why you aren't home sleeping it off. Jeez, you gotta stop this. Go to the bank, but the radio advises, it's now or never. So you keep driving, frayed nerves driving, what seems like forever and ever and ever until you simply have to close your eyes for a minute. You have to stop, pull to the side, lie on the front seat. Tap, tap, tap. And you're up again, staring at yourself in a cop's mirrored sunglasses. Am I acting as if something's wrong? You wonder aloud, stretching your unblinking eyes larger than ever. <laughs> yep. Actually, he does, but luckily for you, your ample breasts work as a distraction and block his view as you turn to get your license out of the purse and slip the money between your purse and the seat. And then smoothly, if a little stiffly, but still not blinking, you say, you have to get going and you're late, didn't think that you would sleep so long. This lie, you're becoming is undoubtedly weighing you down, yet it is promising to set you free. Reluctantly, but for some reason, the cop lets you go, wherein you, knowing nothing about thieving, start tumbling, grasping for logic, figuring it's best to get rid of the car. The mechanic slash car salesman that you find is so slow and too friendly, makes you want to slap him, but instead you thrust $700 at him, an exorbitant, suspicious amount, and drive off in a brand new car with brand new license plates. But what is this? 
the cop and his sunglasses are still following you? You're on the brink, unsure of what to do, and suddenly he turns off at Gorman? Really? Okay, yours is not to reason why. Just let the relief slow your heart down until it starts raining. <laughs> Non-stop hellish rain, accompanied by voices in your head, people, including yourself, trying to understand why you are doing this. Radio sings, she wore an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. Open sexuality for the first time today. Afraid to go in or come out of the water, the air into the open. Come on, rip off your cover, girl, be brave. But there is this rain, intense, exhausting, blinding rain, and out of it, out of it, a neon beacon flashing finally, a saving grace. The Bates Motel. <laughs> <gasps> Relieved, you stop as a guy waltzes up out of the black downpour like Gene Kelly with an umbrella insisting that you call him Norman Bates. <laughs> if you need anything, just tap on the wall. And will you do him the favor of having dinner with him? You willfully ignore the stereotypical haunted house on the hill he glides <laughs> off to. <laughs> and turn your blind eye towards settling in your room. Up in the house on the hill, Norman argues with his mother so loudly you hear every heart-wrenching, berating, belittling word. She calls you, who she's never laid eyes on, a whore. I mean, what does she know? Everything? <laughs> Norman brings sandwiches, milk, a shy wish that we could apologize for other people, and ushers you into the parlor behind his office with a bunch of stuffed birds. You're uneasy among the dead birds, but also hungry, and the room is warm, and you are nothing if not polite, and hell, you've come this far, it's got to be better than 15 miles to Fairview in rainy darkness. You eat like a bird. Norman smiles sweetly. You talk lightly, like you do when there's tension, especially sexual tension, and you can't quite put your finger on what a guy is up to. Instinctively, you remain attentively passive, striking a balance between naivete and watch your step buster, because that's what girls with double D bosoms have to do. <laughs> this guy is odd, perhaps, but tousle-haired, benign, and his taxidermy hobby suits him, and the fact that he only stuffs birds is kind of sweet. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> he says, the birds look good stuffed, because they're passive to begin with. And at this moment, you fail miserably to see what you're seeing. Maybe that's why you're single. Apparently, you can't read guys for shit. <laughs> Look at the dead, creepy bird hovering over Norman's shoulder. But what you say is, a man should have a hobby. <laughs> really? Ain't she sweet? See her that she wore for the first time today. I enjoy being a girl. Then Norman reveals taxidermy is his life. That his mother is his best friend. And while smiling weirdly, he accuses you of never having an empty moment in your life. Only my share, you say, thinking about long nights without Sam, your dead-end job, lunch fucks, and driving through the stormy dark. Where are you going? He asks, and you know what? You don't know. I'm down the wrong road, maybe. Um, Sam's arms, you're hoping to buy off happiness, a, a life where you can enjoy being a girl and what tumbles out of your mouth is a private island. So he talks about private traps, then cuts right to the heart of it, of you, with what are you running, what are you running from? And you think of the 40 grand wrapped in newspaper that you have in your room and you admit that sometimes we deliberately step into those traps, recognizing how sorry you are for him 
born in a trap and how happy you are that you're not him and you give him a pep talk as he goes a little cuckoo over wanting to curse his mother claiming that he doesn't mind his trap and he, oh yes he does i mean look at his jaw his crazy eyes he's all worked up and then he's smiling and then he's worked up and he's smiling and he over insists that his mother's not a maniac he just goes a little mad sometimes we all go a little mad sometimes haven't you <laughs> yes Sometimes just one time can be enough and you fly up off of your chair flushed with repentance. It is now or never. Gotta go back, beg for forgiveness, plead insanity, pull yourself out of your own private trap that you were created before it's too late for you too. Still not really seeing Norman, you tell him that your name is, yes, Marion Crane, yes, just like the bird, long legs, long vulnerable neck, yes, leave him to find and fend for himself. And you are off to wade into the shower to begin the process of washing your sins away. It's odd how quickly it all comes down and what you notice. A vein in his hand, not the one holding the knife, the other one. Your own soft white belly, cheap shower curtain, the wig like a bird's nest on his, or is it his mother's head? You feel remorse for the baby chick you pulled through a fence when you were a child and your unblinking eyes, your yearning for and missing of those million blurry edged rippling moments that led to this, the release of your crimson blood circling the drain, encircling you, trailing down your life, your foot slipping, hand clutching, sliding down, down the tile, trying to truly, sincerely open your eyes at last. Certainly, if you had known then, back before this detour, that keeping your eyes wide open and on the road ahead meant actually waking up and paying attention, truly seeing wouldn't you have... What? Could it have been any other way? So I ask you, very confidentially, it's now or never, devil or angel, did you enjoy being a girl?